Lauren Spearer was a 20-year-old student at Indiana University. Like most undergrads, she enjoyed visiting local bars and having drinks with her friends. This was her plan for the night of June 2, 2011. Instead, her night of fun ended in tragedy. A close friend of Lauren claims that she left his apartment walking home at 4.30 a.m. She was never seen again. Did Lauren meet with harm on her walk home? Or do the answers to her disappearance lie with the friends she was with that night? Hello, welcome to the Fact and Suspicion Podcast. I'm your host, Dan. And I'm your other host, Ben. And tonight's mystery is the disappearance of Lauren Spearer. So Dan, who was Lauren and what happened to her? Lauren was a 20-year-old college student at Indiana University. She had just finished her second year of college, and she was originally from Scarsdale, New York. Kind of interesting little side note of how she ended up at Indiana University. She, when she was in high school, she actually went to a summer camp in Pennsylvania mm-hmm. called Camp Tawanda. And that is where she met several of the friends that ended up attending Indiana University with her. They, they apparently all decided to go there together. And her boyfriend, Jesse Wolf, went to that camp with her, and he also went to Indiana University. And someone else involved in the case named Jay Rosenbaum. She knew him for several years from that camp as well, was at Indiana University. Okay, so just to clarify, this was a a summer camp where she met people who ended up attending college with her? Yeah, that's correct. And that seems like a strange detail, but the fact that she has known some of the people involved in this case for several years, more than longer than she's been in college, is kind of important. So I thought we should mention that. Now, this happened on... Well, it was the night of June 2nd, but really the entire story takes place after midnight. So it's technically the morning of June 3rd, 2011. I mean, she was out drinking, so that's expected, right? Yeah, exactly. So Lauren gets started at 12.30 a.m. She and a friend of hers named David Roan left her apartment at 12.30 and walk over to Jay Rosenbaum's apartment to start pre-gaming. And yes, I said they're pre-gaming at 12.30 a.m. That makes me feel so old, right? (laughs) No question, buddy. It's it's been a while since those days, huh? (laughs) Yeah, it really has. Um, Oh, and I should also mention that her boyfriend, Jesse Wolf, was not with her tonight. He had actually stayed home to watch the NBA Finals. And Jesse said he had been texting with Lauren throughout the night. But he was not with her at all that night. So um, she and David get to Jay's apartment. And uh, Corey Rossman is there. Corey is a friend of Lauren's. She'd only known for a couple weeks, but he's Jay's neighbor. And uh, they all get together and they're drinking pre-gaming. And then David, the friend that she came with, decides to head back home. Right. So Lauren wants to go out to a bar. So she and Corey walk down to Kilroy's sports bar. And uh, Jay stays home. He doesn't go. Right. Uh, And... We do have security camera footage at 1.46 a.m. of Corey and Lauren entering Kilroy's. Okay. Now, we don't really know exactly what happens at Kilroy's, how many drinks she has. uh, But when she leaves, she does seem to be quite a bit more intoxicated because she left her cell phone at the bar and her shoes. How would she leave her shoes at the bar? So Kilroy's is apparently a very big bar and they have a sandy area that's supposed to resemble a beach and people like to kick their shoes off and walk around in the sand. That's interesting. It's interesting and it makes sense as to why she would take her shoes off. Right. Though you'd think she'd realize about the time she left the bar that she that didn't she have them wearing on. Shoes. Yeah, she must have been pretty intoxicated then. And just to be clear, uh, his name's Corey, the guy she was with, right? Corey Rossman. And he wasn't one of her friends from the uh, from the summer camp, right? No, she met only, him through other friends. She she met him because he was a, a neighbor of Jay's, and she'd only known him for a week or two at this point, not very long. Okay. So Corey and Lauren leave the bar at two twenty seven. That's when we have security footage of them leaving, and about two thirty, we have security footage of them uh, entering her apartment complex. They're going back to Lauren's apartment. Now, when they get into Lauren's apartment complex, 
something happens. They run into a group of four guys. They're all students at Indiana. One of them is named Zach Oaks. And these guys and Corey have somewhat of a disagreement. We don't know exactly what that is. Those details have been released, but they mostly seem to center around they were unhappy about something that's going on with Corey and Lauren. Maybe they saw how intoxicated she was and they didn't want Corey to be taking advantage of her, taking her back to her apartment. We don't know exactly, but we do know. Were they friends with Lauren or were they just random passersby or what? We, we don't know. We don't know if they're friends with Lauren. Um, though we do know that Corey does get a bit mouthy with them and Corey gets punched. Oh, so it got and, physical then. Okay. Yeah, it got physical. And from what Corey says, he got punched pretty hard because he says because of that, he has no memories past that point in the night. Uh-huh. That doesn't strike me as particularly believable, but okay. Sounds convenient, right? Uh, yeah. I would almost be- believe it if he said he was blackout drunk and didn't remember anything, but he just happened to get punched so hard he couldn't remember anything. It's really weird. So he was able to function for the rest of the night. He just doesn't remember it. Well, he was able to function for a little while. Yeah, I'm going to call shenanigans on that, but continue. Okay. At any rate, they're in her apartment complex, but after this little altercation, they don't go into her apartment. And I don't know why. No one knows why they didn't go to her apartment. Maybe the police know why. Maybe Corey told the police, but those details have never been released. So are they certain that that neither of them went in? Is is there any possibility that she just ran in and grabbed something real quick? I suppose there may be that possibility, but every report I've read says they did not go into the apartment. Okay. Seems a uh, bit strange, but... That's, that's the information that the police released, and the police have been pretty tight-lipped about the case, so a lot of details they just haven't released. So is it possible that maybe it was just them trying to avoid further conflict with the uh, with the guys he had had the altercation with? Maybe they were in the way and they just didn't want to. They just decided to go somewhere else. I'd say that was pretty likely. Uh, like I said, we don't know for sure, but that seems it's plausible, like right? Probably the case. Uh, it's possible that those guys may have been friends with her boyfriend Jesse, mm-hmm. and maybe she thought that they call Jesse up and he'd be jealous that she was, you know, hanging out with Corey this late. I don't know, but something, for some reason they didn't go into her apartment. They left and they head, uh, to Corey's apartment. And how far is this away? It's just about two blocks away. It's not far. Okay, So it's so not far. Right. Yeah. Um, now we do have security footage of them again at two forty eight AM. They're walking into an alley between two buildings. Uh, I, I think they're cutting through there to go toward Corey's apartment. Okay. And uh, three minutes later, they come out of the alley on the other side. That's 2.51 a.m. Mm-hmm. Something very interesting, though, is that later on, Lauren's purse and keys were found in that alley. Really? So Was apparently this during she, the investigation they were found? Mm-hmm, they were found during the investigation. Apparently, she dropped those in that alley uh, at some point right there, you know, by accident. Uh, Now, apparently she was very inebriated at this point. Right. And at some point on the way back, Corey actually had to pick her up and carry her. So if she was that bad off, I can understand her dropping something accidentally there. Do they think, did the police think she dropped it uh, then when they cut through there? Or was this maybe later at some point? It seems it seems to think that she had to drop it then because we don't have reports of any other security footage of her going into that alley that night. Okay. Uh, So so how long were they in the alley? Do we know that? Only about three minutes. Is that time appropriate for the length of the alley? You know, I've seen a picture of the alley, and I don't have an exact measurement, but I think if you know both of them are sort of stumbling, it seems like a decent amount of time to spend in the alley trying to get through it. Okay, so so no, like it wasn't like a suspicious length of time no. or anything. It wasn't a tiny little alley either. It was, it was pretty lengthy. So All right, yeah, I would I'm say curious. definitely. I said it's definitely a good amount of time for them to make their way through there. All right. So uh, then they arrive at Corey's apartment. Now Corey has a roommate named Mike Beth, and uh, according to Mike, he had been up all night studying. Now 
I don't know if he was really up studying or if that just sounds good, you know, when his parents see that on the news, right? Right. But he he was up apparently. Yeah, I know all those all nighters I pulled studying in college. <laughs> right. When all my friends were out drinking. I, I remember pulling them with you, sir. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Study partners. Well, at any rate, um, Mike says when they come in, they're both stumbling. They're both very intoxicated. Corey even vomits coming up the stairs. Okay. And, uh, so they were both wasted. Then. They're both wasted. And as soon as they get up to the apartment, Mike escorts Corey off to his bedroom and Corey passes out. Okay. And that's the end of his story for the night. Uh, now. So just curiosity, do we have confirmation from anyone outside of these guys that she's alive at this point? No. Okay. Just, just curious. As far as, as we know, no security footage of her after that alley exists. Now it could exist and the police haven't released it. Right. But as far as we know, we have access to after two fifty one, there's no footage of her. To okay. prove she's alive. All right, I was I was just curious. So Mike says that he tried to get her to stay the night at the apartment because she's in really bad shape. And she didn't want to. She was wanting to get back to her place. She didn't want to stay there. So Mike's just kind of, you know, at wit's end with her, as much as I can tell. And he knows that his neighbor Jay Rosenbaum knows her much better than he does. Mike doesn't really know her that well. Okay. So he calls Jay up and asks if she can come over to his apartment, if Jay could, you know, maybe take care of her and get her to stay the night there. And Jay says, sure. So about 3.30 is when she leaves uh, Mike and Corey's apartment and goes to Jay's apartment. Uh, So she left by herself on foot? Well, no, they're in the same building. Oh, okay. Okay. They're in the same building. Right. Like so, it's it's really not a big deal for her to go over there. Mike may have walked her over. I don't know, but she she but, got to Jay's apartment according to Jay. Okay, so either way, it's just just it's not very far at all. Right, exactly. And um, Jay tries to get her to stay the night there as well, and uh, he actually notices that she has uh, some bruises on her face, and he's assuming that's where she's been falling down. But I guess we don't know that for sure. Mm-hmm. But she had been falling down a lot, so that's very possible. So. Uh, Jay wants her to stay the night there, stay on the couch, and she says no. She wants to get back to her apartment. So uh, (laughs) Lauren uses Jay's phone to make a couple phone calls, try to find someone to get her back to her place. Um, But no one picks up. She makes two calls. One of them is to David Roan, the friend from earlier, and she doesn't get a hold of him. And then another call is made, but we don't know who that second call was to, and that person doesn't pick up on it. She never called her boyfriend? We don't know. It could have been Jesse she called right. the second call, but we don't know that. The recipient of the second call has never been released. And she's using someone else's phone at this point, right? Right. She's using Jay's because hers was left at the bar. Yeah, I just I, I didn't know if they had gone back and got it that night or if this was discovered during the investigation. Her her phone, uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you exactly about the phone in just a few minutes. Okay. Uh, so she can't get a ride back to her apartment, and she wants to go back to her apartment. So Jay says that she leaves his apartment walking and he says that he's watching her out the door and he sees her turn south on College Street and start walking south on College Street about 430 in the morning. And that's about a two block walk, right? And that what we established earlier. Yeah, it's yeah. I was looking at a map and it's two blocks from there where she turns on a College Street to her apartment. So on foot, what's that? Five minutes? Maybe, maybe, maybe a little longer. You know, she's okay. Yeah, drunk. She's, she's drunk too. So. Maybe ten minutes. Okay, yeah. But she was never. Safe. She never made it back to her apartment. She was never seen again. And the only word we have that she ever left that apartment is Rosenbaum. Right? Is my correct? Exactly. It's it's only Jay Rosenbaum's word. Did anyone else see her that we know of? No. Like even any of the other guys? No. Uh, apparently, Jay Rosenbaum did have a house guest that night. Someone from out of town. Mm-hmm. Someone named David is the only information I can get. They refer to as David B. Every time I see this, I can't find an article c- to confirm this. This is mostly on web sleuths and Reddit. I found this, but he was apparently asleep through all of that. Okay, so he couldn't corroborate it one way or the other. So he then. couldn't corroborate it at all. All right. 
So yeah, we only really have Jay's word that she left. And she was barefoot walking home. And no cell phone. No cell phone. God, that's dangerous, man. It is. It really is. Especially, you know, I didn't mention this, but Lauren was four foot eleven and ninety pounds. You know, if oh, someone she was tiny. Yeah, and if someone wanted to do her harm, it would have been so easy with her just being tiny and so intoxicated at that point. Yeah, no, no question. But I think it would be easy to chalk her decision to walk home up to just a drunken mistake. But really, we probably only think that because we know what happened to her. I mean, she was only, what, two blocks from her home? She had probably done this a million times. So even though she was drunk, it's hard to even consider that a mistake. And, and you know, this is a college town. And from everything I understand, Indiana University is a really big party school, right? Right. So even though the bars have been closed for a little while at this point, you still it's like probably have some activity on the streets. Right? Yeah, you still probably have drunk people walking home. You know, yeah, exactly. College students live everywhere, right and there. Usually, college towns like very well lit too, because people, you know, they're everything's designed so that things are in walking distance, right? Right, exactly. So, a couple other facts about that night: some strange things. Um, okay, one. A homeless man did report that he heard a woman scream around 4.30 a.m. Okay. Uh, but that same homeless man was found dead in a dumpster a couple days later. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, so I don't know exactly what it tells us, right? I mean. Exactly, yeah. right. And, um, and you know, we, we never could get any more, you know, anything else from him, any more information. And who knows what he heard? It. It doesn't mean it that could was have been anything, her. right? Could have been anything, right? It could have been, you know, like another drunk girl just Excited yelling scream. at someone, exciting right. scream or something, you know, or something like that. We don't know. Uh, another piece of information: there was a bar owner that said he saw a woman being carried over a man's shoulder around three thirty a.m. Well, would that have been around the time that I mean, you said that Corey had to carry her at some point, right? Would yeah, that have been about then. Three thirty seems like it's a little bit later than when he would have been carrying her through. But there. he could be mistaken about the time, though, right? He, he could, like, so, like the bar owner could have been mistaken about the time, and that could have been. He could have seen Corey carrying her, so you know that's just just another detail of someone that reported that. But the police could never uh, corroborate that on any security footage of seeing a woman being carried. Okay, All right, um, and that that kind of you. Know, ends that night what happens after that is all three of those guys she was with that night lawyered up right well when was she reported missing oh i'm sorry i, I completely forgot to tell you that um the next morning her boyfriend wakes up mm-hmm. and uh tries to call her and he can't get through to her and he gets a text back from one of the employees at kilroy sports bar because she left her phone there Oh, okay. And that's when he finds out that she doesn't have her phone, and that's when he called and reported her missing. Wait, he called the police immediately? He didn't even bother going by her apartment first? That's what it sounds like to me. That's what it was said. He may have called her roommate. You know, he may have called yeah. Jay Rosenbaum, but he did call and report her. He's the one that called and reported her missing. Okay, that, that's, yes, that seems reasonable. So, like I said, all three of the guys she was with that night lawyered up uh, once she was missing. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people take that as a sign of guilt, but... Yeah, but as a rule, I don't like to hold the fact that someone gets an attorney against them. I mean, particularly with researching these cases, knowing how police uh, can jump to conclusions and how early suspects, how they can get tonal vision. I mean, I perfectly understand getting a getting an attorney. And really, that doesn't say anything about whether they cooperated with the investigation, right? Do we know whether that's the case? Their attorneys all say they've cooperated with the police. Uh, one thing they would not do, though, is submit to polygraph tests by the police. Now, Jay Rosenbaum and Mike Beth's attorney both say that they did take uh, privately administered polygraphs and polygraphs administered by the FBI, but they would not take polygraphs administered by the uh, Bloomington Police Department. I mean, again, some people might find that suspicious, but I... I don't think there's any problem with not taking polygraph exa- examinations. They're they're unreliable, and hell, they you said they took two, right? Do yeah. we know the results of them? I mean, nothing. No, that was that was never released. 
And honestly, like a privately administered polygraph, I don't think it means anything, right? But like I said, I don't, I don't put much stock in polygraphs either. And I think it was good that they got lawyers early on because, well, we'll get to that in a little bit, but there was actually a civil lawsuit against them later on. Um, strangely enough, though, you know, even Jesse, her boyfriend, ends up with a lawyer, even though he wasn't even involved in anything that night. Um, was Lauren's he family. home watching the basketball game all night? He was, yeah. And uh, Lauren's family said he helped in the search for two days, but then his parents came down and got him and got him a lawyer. Now, this is, from what I understand, because the police were just asking him a ton of questions and everything. Right. I think he got nervous and, and felt like he needed to protect himself. I mean, so. that's understandable, dude. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't blame him at all. You know, the police always look at the boyfriend, right? Of course, yeah. And, you know, he was a young guy. He was scared, I'm sure. I don't blame him at all. I know Lauren's family, they felt sort of betrayed that he wasn't helping in the search anymore. But it's probably best that he extricated himself from it, right? Yeah, don't blame him in the slightest. Now, um, like I said, you know, a lot of people take this as signs of guilt that, that these guys had something to do with what happened to her. and. I'm not saying that's not possible. Oh, but, that's definitely still possible. Yeah. I'm just saying that I just don't think the fact they got attorneys is necessarily indicative of it, right? Right. We shouldn't hold that against them, right? Um, so let's let's go into some of the theories of what could have happened to her, right? The most prevalent theory, especially among people that were you know on campus going to school at Indiana at the time, mm -hmm. is that Lauren overdosed that night and died, and whoever she, she was with had to get rid of her body. Did she have a history of uh, drug abuse, either or uh, casual drug use, even? Well, I wouldn't say she has a history of abuse, but uh, Jay Rosenbaum did say that night she snorted cocaine and crushed up clonopin. That's dangerous, no question. That is dangerous, particularly if she didn't use uh, if she doesn't use very often, right? Right. Mixing a CNS depressant and a stimulant that's not that's not especially safe. Not safe at all. Uh, now, but let's talk about like if she had a history of this, right? The police did find some cocaine in her apartment. Uh -huh. We don't know what that means, but I, it's not that strange for a college student to, to have, have cocaine. some cocaine. No, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not trying to cast aspersions on her. And I hate to even bring up her drug use because yeah. I don't want to seem like I'm victim blaming here because I'm not. I but did much to worse case. when I was her age and well after. So, yeah, I mean, no blame is, here. This is something that college students do. They party. It's she's not doing anything out of the ordinary, right? Right, but you know, it's also relevant to the investigation, right? Oh. Exactly, exactly, it is. Um, so there was that, and uh, Jay Rosenbaum's parents did make a statement that she was asked to leave that summer camp because of drug use. Now we don't know if that's exactly true, though. We did, did has find, anyone else corroborated that at all? Well, we do know that she was asked to leave the camp at one point, but there was no reason why. And even if it was drug use, I mean, she could have been smoking marijuana. Pot for probably, yeah. Know. That's and that's not indicative of you know drug abuse in the long term history of drug abuse. Of course not, no. But to go along with the fact that she did have cocaine, clonopin, and a lot of alcohol that night, it's important for us to know that she had a heart condition called Long QT syndrome. I don't know exactly what that is, but... I don't know much about it either, but I read about it a bit, and it can cause irregular heartbeats. And apparently, with that combination of drugs, it could be fatal. Oh, okay. And I guess the alcohol didn't help her. Didn't help either, right? No, especially in combination with the alcohol. It's just very dangerous. I mean, clonopin is a is a benzo, uh, benzodiazepine. Is that how right. it's pronounced, right? Yeah. And you should not be mixing benzos with alcohol to start no. with, especially not with that kind of condition. Um, I mean, it's and, not necessarily lethal, I mean, unless you take a lot, right? But with especially with everything else she was taking and the heart and the heart condition, yeah, that's 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 a recipe for disaster, there, man. I said if she was snorting the crushed up clonopin too, who knows how much she got, right? And that the clonopin has you know such a long half life that's going to be affecting her for quite a while after. Yeah, so yeah, it would have been in her system for hours afterwards, right? And uh, so, you know, a lot of people think that, you know, she could have, you know, overdosed and died from that. And that's very possible. Um, Rosenbaum was the one that, uh, like, she used the drugs at his place, right? Jay Rosenbaum said that she used 
those drugs that night. He didn't necessarily say it was it was at his apartment, though I'm assuming it was. How else would he have known? Right, right. right. And for all we know, he could have supplied the drugs, which would possibly give him some sort of liability in her death if that's what happened to him. Right? Yeah, of course. I don't know if... I'm not trying to say that these guys, this did happen, that she died and they got rid of her body. I mean, we but, have to take that into consideration, right? I mean, yeah, because it, the only plausible. evidence we have that she ever left that uh, ever left that apartment complex is is their word, right? It is exactly. It's Jay's word because she wasn't even around Mike and Corey at that point. But th- they say that they that she left their place, right? Yes. Well, Mike says that Corey had already gone to his room, passed right? Out. He, he was passed out drunk. Okay. Uh, Mike says that she went to Jay's apartment, and then Jay says she left his place walking. Now I can. So we have I, nothing but Corey's word that they ever got to the apartment complex in the first place. And we only have Corey's and Mike's word that they got to the apartment complex. Okay. Because Mike met them when they came in. So we can be pretty confident that she at least got to the apartment complex. Yeah, we do have, you know, Corey, Mike, and Jay apparently also are at the apartment complex. But we only have one person, Rosenbaum, who so claims to leave. have seen her leave, right? Yes. Okay. And that does, you know, and like I said, I'm not trying to cast aspersions on his character or anything like that. I don't know no. what happened, but it definitely, you know, with just his word that she left, it does seem a bit suspicious. Well, I mean, and, you have to take that into consideration, right? I mean, let's say he did supply her with those drugs. He could have felt, you know, like he was could in have been danger motivation, right? If she died from that, and he might have felt that he needed to, to do something. Yeah, of course. So th- that's possible. And another way that I started to think about this is I was thinking, you know, if she OD'd at his house and, you know, was having a medical emergency, I'd like to think that he would have gotten her to a hospital or called an ambulance. But what if, you know, the clonopin is such a, a, a sedative, you know, um, such a tranquilizer? Right. You know, what if he just, you know, left her alone and she went to sleep on the couch and he came back in 30 minutes later and she had died? Right. You know, yeah, I mean, that's definitely that a possibility. Be, would that be diff- a different way of looking at it? If she's already dead, would he still call the authorities or would he panic and try to do something? I mean, I could definitely understand him panicking, right? I mean, it, right. especially if he had anything to do with giving her the drugs, right? And felt like he right. could be liable. Yeah, I, I could see that happening. So, you know, that's that's a definite possibility of what happened, I think. Yeah, I'm um, sure the police considered that. Pro- they probably did. I would think so. And, you know, I have to assume that the police have more security footage that they haven't released. So they may have actually seen her walking back at some point, and we don't know that. Right, right. So that, you know, that remains to be seen. Uh, but that's one theory is that those people she was with did something. Right? So it, it seems like if the police had footage that would have shown her leaving but she never came out, that they would have leaned on them a lot more than it seems like they did. I, d- I would think that, yeah. I, w- I would think that, definitely. Um, so we just don't have any answers. Right. There's- like that almost seems to suggest that they do, in fact, have footage that's unreleased that shows her leaving. Now, I, I don't know so. that, of course, but, th- but if they did almost suggest that a bit. Maybe, but maybe there were no security cameras right there where she would have left the apartment. And with right. no I, real I was evidence, prefacing that, I was prefacing yeah. well, yeah. that on if, right? If they, if such a camera existed, well, definitely. But but we also have to look at the possibility that that camera doesn't exist, and there's really no evidence that they can prove that she didn't leave. Right, right. And at that point, I guess that would make it a lot harder for them to. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, are there any other uh, any other suspects or any other uh, uh, possible explanations for for what definitely. happened to her? Yeah. Definitely. Well, well, you know what? I should add to uh, this this theory about her friends having to dispose of her body. Right. That um, there was another person that that made this claim, and uh, I have to do a little background on this. There was a, a student named Corey Hammersley uh, at Indiana, and he was also uh, involved in some of the same circles that Lauren was. And he was uh, heavily into drugs. And in 2013, he was arrested because he was high and kind of flipped out and was outside naked shooting at the police. Oh, and uh, okay. Yeah, he had sort of a meltdown. I'm assuming he went to prison for this. He did. He went to prison. Now, what happens in prison is that another inmate hears him saying, you know, when they, they see 
the Lauren Spear case come on television, like Corey says, Hey, I knew that girl. I know the guys that had to get rid of her because she OD'd and they dumped her body in the Ohio River. Right? Mm, I mean, jailhouse informants mean very little to me. Yeah, the, I, I understand that. But the, the guy that heard that did go report that and they ended up questioning Corey Hammersley and he, you know, wouldn't talk. He didn't say anything. So he didn't bother to deny it. I think it was just more along the lines of, you I ain't know, talking I'm, to not, the cops. I'm not talking to the cops, right? right. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, maybe he did deny it, but they didn't actually release that. Maybe if he had denied it, then it's going to look bad on, you know, to him in prison. Who knows exactly? The- so is it possible that he had information that, that, that her overdosing was on the table and he could have just been talking a big game in prison? Yeah, you know, I mean, I mean that's something that had been people, the students had been saying Right. For a long time, right? So he, so he could have known that that was a possibility. I'm sure he knew that was a possibility already. I mean, he wasn't arrested until 2013, and Lauren disappeared in 2011. Ah, uh, okay. okay. So, you know, people have been talking about that for years. So right. I'm, I'm sure he was, even if he did say that, he was just he was just talking a big game. Yeah, that, that means absolutely nothing to me. But It's it interesting, was, of course. But. Yeah, and well, actually, you know, it made the news, though, that... About that, because someone thought they had it solved, and then, you know, it turned out to be nothing. Then, you know, there was a lot of talk about her being abducted by a biker gang. A biker which, gang? Yeah, again, no evidence whatsoever to that. But apparently, Indiana is has a lot of, of biker gangs. But what is it with people, with people thinking biker gangs are involved in these crimes? I don't know. I, I mean, don't with, know. who was it? The, the last one we were looking at... Uh, Lawson, uh, Brandon Lawson. Yeah, people yeah. People think a biker gang had something to do with that one. They did. They're like they they thought that bikers came along and uh, and got him. Right. Yeah. I don't know. I think that's people's minds just go to that. You know, maybe around the time of this case, people have been watching Sons of Anarchy a lot. So, was there any evidence that there might have been a biker gang involved? Was was there testimony? Or did any eyewitnesses claim to have heard bikes revving or anything like that? No. No, no. That was, so this is just was pure speculation. Just, just pure conjecture. speculation, as far as I can tell. However, gotcha. I think it was Dateline actually went and tried to interview uh, one of the biker guys that everyone oh, was ta- saying that had abducted her. And he said something along the lines of, I never knew the broad. He actually said broad. He said broad. Yeah. And he said, please leave me alone. I don't want to talk to you. But... Uh, that was just something people had been saying, you know, like rumors. But people look into rumors, right? Uh, fair enough. I mean, I still I don't see what people's obsession with biker gangs is. I mean, I don't either. But there's another long shot that is much more interesting. No and biker gangs this time? No biker gangs. Okay. Much more plausible, actually. Lauren disappeared early in the morning of June 3rd. Okay. There is proof that on that day, the infamous serial killer Israel Keys was in the state of Indiana. Okay, so when you say he was in the state, is there any indication that he was nearby, or was he just no. in the state? He was just in the state. He had some transactions on the toll roads in the northern part of the state. Okay, and, and this was farther south. So he had the list, right? He is the one with the list, isn't He's he? He's the one with the list. Was um, she on it? She was not on the list. Okay. Let, let, can, I don't know. I'm assuming everyone knows that's listening to this knows about Israel Keys because he's pretty famous among true crime fans. But no, I he was a pretty explain. prolific serial killer. He's very prolific, yeah. He was um, a, ki- a killer that would hide kill kits in various places around the country. And he would, before he ever found a victim, he would have picked out a place to kill them and a place to dispose of the body. And he almost always abducted the victim in one state, went to a second state to murder them, and then disposed of the body in a third state. And this this part of Indiana, that was it was plausible for that to happen with three states. Right. Though we don't know for sure that, that happened. But I can't not mention that Israel Keys was in the state. Oh, on of that course day. not. Yeah, it's definitely interesting to Right. It's definitely an interesting piece of information. I mean how important it is to the case, who knows? If we can't put him anywhere near her at the time, you know, it just it seems more like a interesting piece of trivia than something that's particularly important to the case, to be honest with you. 
I agree with that, though. I do feel like if he had a kill kit around there and had a place selected, if he happened to be driving down that road that night and saw Lauren stumbling drunk, that was a good opportunity for him. Oh, yeah. Right? A monster like him? No question. But that seems like quite a long shot. I mean, that's a, it's a lot of ifs, right? There's a, a lot, lot of, of a lot of conjecture there. But there is another suspect that this is probably close to as likely as the intoxication overdose uh, dying from her heart condition theory. Okay. Um, is a killer named Daniel Messel. Should I be familiar with him? I don't believe I am. I don't think so, unless you were familiar with the case of Hannah Wilson. Uh, it doesn't uh, ring a bell, no. Hannah was a student in Indiana who was killed in 2015. She had also been out drinking with her friends, and she had actually been drinking at the same bar at Kilroy's. Really? Uh, where where Lauren was drinking. That's and the one with the, the little beach area, right? Yes, that's the one. Okay. And uh, she was walking home, and Daniel Messel drove by and picked her up. He was planning on taking her to a certain place, and for some reason, maybe the road was closed, he couldn't get to that place. And something went wrong, so he killed her and had to dispose of her body somewhere else. Right. And by some crazy mistake, he drops his phone right there with her body. He dropped his phone where he, he dropped killed her? his phone when he killed her. And Okay. Uh, and obviously they were able to track him right down. So the police found the body the next morning. They found the phone. They go to his house. They catch him with bags of like bloody clothing and stuff. So it was. Like he was literally caught red handed then. Literally caught red handed. Uh, so in, at any rate, uh, they start looking into Daniel Messel. And for a few years, women had reported, you know, uh, this guy trying to pick them up, being assaulted by this guy, different stuff. And they were actually able to match him with DNA to one of these incidents from 2012. Uh, really? he had he had picked a woman up, offered her a ride home after she'd been out drinking, and she got kind of scared when she was in the car with him. And then she said that he tried to assault her, but she fought him off, right, and got out of the car and he drove off. Well, she had scratched him, and they were able to take a sample from under her fingernail. Then you know, these years later, when they catch Daniel Messel, they run that DNA against his, and it's a match. Wow. So we know that he was picking up women that were walking down the street and assaulting them as far back as 2012. Even on the same stretch of road, too. Yeah, it, yes, exactly. This so was, he was he was caught, what, about four years after she went missing? It, he was. Yeah. And how far back do we have victims that, that claim that he at least tried? We have them dating back to 2012, and Lauren went missing in 2011. So, I mean, she could have been one of his first victims. She could have if it was. Now, now I should note, um, Lauren's family hired a private investigator, mm -hmm. and he believes that she was not killed by Daniel Messel. He believes that they are similar cases, but not related. Does he have a, a theory of his own that he thinks is more likely? Well, Lauren's family did file a civil suit against the three guys she was with that night against. Okay. Uh, so they don't think the family doesn't think she ever the left the apartment complex. Doesn't think she ever left the car apartment complex. I don't think Now that's not exactly what they sued for. They sued that. Well, the claim was that because these three guys had, you know, allowed her to get too drunk and then, you know, allowed her to leave. They uh, were responsible for injury to her or what happened to her. Right. So it sounds like they were saying that it was just like uh, like third party liability, like like what restaurants are can be charged with, right? Yeah, it's actually called uh, the the Dram Shop Act, I believe. Okay. Uh, well, in Indiana, that's what it's called, and they they were using that against Rossman and Rosenbaum. I'm guessing they didn't get very far with that. Well, I can go ahead and explain. Uh, they filed suit against Corey Rossman, uh, Mike Beth. And Jay Rosenbaum, right? Okay. Now, they only filed with the Dram Shop Law against Rossman and Rosenbaum because Beth really didn't do any drinking with her, apparently. Uh, but they did feel like Beth should have some sort of liability for letting her you know, leave and not taking care of her. 
Uh, the judge he... actually dismissed the case against Beth very early on. What was he supposed to do? Like hold her captive? Well, exactly right. Maybe they thought that she he should have walked her home or something along those lines. Or I mean, that just... would be gentlemanly, sure. But right. I mean, it's not like he had any legal liability for not doing so. No, and he actually took her to Jay Rosenbaum at any rate. Uh, so he he was sort of clear he... from that. Right, and uh, he didn't know her very well either, right? He didn't, no. And the, the judge said that, you know, Mike Beth had no, you know, legal responsibility to take care of her, and that's why that was dismissed. Right. Uh, however, the cases for the Dram Shop Law went forward, mm -hmm. and they were eventually dismissed because there's no proof of what actually happened to Lauren. So right. without proof of any sort of injury to her, they can't prove that the actions of Roseman and Rossman caused such injury. Of course, yeah. So those they were all dismissed. But I do feel like the private investigator was probably working toward what the, the parents of Lauren were trying to pursue, which was against these three guys, because they feel right. they feel like these guys are, are a bit of the problem, right? Yeah. And, you know, there's been a lot of hard feelings between them. You know, they... They even had a, you know, a bad break with her boyfriend, with Jesse. Mm -hmm. Jesse Wolf's mother actually said, this poor little girl is not with us today because of her drug abuse. Oh, that's, that's harsh, man. It is. And, you know, like, I understand she's trying to, like, stand up Protect for her son, son. Right. But that's, like, that's some serious victim blaming there. Yeah. Like, I understand that where the parents are coming from here. I mean... Like her, her family. I mean, you know, grieving parents. Though, you know, I'm not particularly convinced by the third party liability claims. There, I'll be honest. No, I'm not either. And I sort of got the idea that they felt like these guys knew what happened to her, and they were just trying to make them pay somehow. Right. Trying yeah, that's that's what somehow. that seems like. And you know, it's understandable from grieving parents. Exactly. And they're still, you know, to this day, they're still running a website and trying to find out what happened to her. I mean, and whether they were liable for, you know, for what happened to her, I mean, that doesn't mean that they didn't do something to her, right? I mean, those are two different questions. There's very different things. Very different. Um, but, you know, the, the mystery goes on to this day. No one, well, I'm sure someone knows what happened to Lauren, but the right. public has no idea. It's it's another really frustrating one where there's just not a lot of information. There's not much to go on. No, and the police have remained really tight-lipped. It's understandable. This. And, you know, the thing about this case is this is not one of those cases where, you know, she could have just died and vanished. It's not like Mara Murray. Mara Murray could have wandered off into the woods and died. Right, of course. That's not something that could happen in the middle of Bloomington. No. So... Someone had to either harm her or do something to get rid of her body if she just died. I mean, especially with the time frame we're dealing with here. Two blocks. Two blocks, yeah. Like, that's not very far to walk. No, not at all. And if she'd had some sort of medical emergency on the way, then somebody would have found her, right? Yeah, they would have found her, you know, along the street there. Even if she had gotten lost because she was just too inebriated, someone would have still found her later of on. Of course, yeah. Somewhere around there. This is not, you know, out in a rural area. This is the middle of a college town. Right. Yeah, it seems like there's two options, right? Either one, she never left that apartment complex that night, or two, she was harmed uh, uh, harmed or abducted after she left, immediately after, just about. Right. So someone has broken a law somewhere here. Yeah. There's Someone is at fault in some way. Yeah, I mean, I don't see any way around it, right? Well, and that's pro that's probably why the police have remained pretty tight lipped about this because they know they know there is someone you know to blame. There's someone they need to find, right? So yeah, yeah. I mean, this seems like a pretty clear cut. Um, well, I don't want to say it seems like a clear cut homicide because there's always the possibility that she died of a you know of a combination of the heart condition, you know, the drugs in her system, and the alcohol, and right. then the the guys are just guilty of covering it up. Exactly. Which, I guess I can understand that they're young and they're trying, they may have had drugs in the apartment and they yeah, didn't. I mean, that doesn't it. doesn't justify it doesn't justify course. it at all. But I can understand, I guess, their reasoning behind. No, it. I can I'm understand not, that panic, right? I, I can mean, understand the panic. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I I can see someone doing that, even though 
That's no excuse, though. No, not in the slightest. So, yeah, Ben, that's pretty much the case. Did you have any other questions about it? I believe we've covered just about everything, man. Uh, at least all the questions I could come up with. Uh, it's it's another one of those where there's just there's no good answers, right? No, there there it's, really aren't. There aren't. So I guess the, the answer is no. I, I have no further questions. All right. Well, again, Lauren Spearer disappeared in the early morning hours of June third, twenty eleven. She was four foot eleven. 90 pounds, blonde, and she was last seen barefoot, wearing black leggings and a white shirt, walking south on College Street through Bloomington. If you happen to know anything or have any information, you can contact the Bloomington, Indiana Police Department. The investigation is still ongoing. Thank you for listening to Fact and Suspicion. If you liked what you heard, Please consider sharing it with a friend, and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future content.